This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nano Fabrication. I'm Chris Mack, your professor for this course, and this is Lecture 5, Doping. Now here we're not talking about sports or athletes, we're talking about semiconductor doping. What is doping in the world of semiconductor processing? Well, doping is intentionally adding impurities into the crystal structure of the semiconductor in order to change the mobile carrier concentration. Remember, there's in semiconductors two kinds of mobile charge carriers, electrons and holes. The concentration of mobile electrons is called N. The concentration of mobile holes is called P. Uh, and so what we're trying to do with doping is to incorporate an impurity of material other than, say, silicon for a silicon semiconductor into the silicon crystal structure so that we change the concentration of mobile charge carriers to be different from that of intrinsic material. Intrinsic material is pure material, undoped material. It doesn't have to be exactly pure. It's not if you have some defects or some certain amounts of impurity that are very, very small. We still call this intrinsic material because we're not intentionally adding dopants. Or the level of the unintentional impurities is so small as to not have a major impact on the behavior of that material. We call it intrinsic semiconductors. Extrinsic material is doped semiconductor. Well, what is this doping? Well, we have two kinds of dopants. We call them accept donors. We'll see those names come about as we look at the operation of these impurities within the crystal structure. Acceptors come from the group three column of the periodic table. And generally, that means boron. Sometimes we use gallium, but in general, we're always using boron for our acceptors. For donors, we're looking at the group 5 column in the periodic table, and that is phosphorus, arsenic, and antimony. It's very important that we're using group 3 or group 5, as we'll see. Let's take a look at intrinsic silicon, which is made up of a group 4 material, silicon, in our example. Uh, silicon has four electrons in its outer shell. It forms bonds with four other silicons in a tetrahedral structure. Uh, here we show it in just a flat representation, but each silicon is bonded to four others, sharing an electron so that every silicon in the crystal structure has eight electrons around it in a stable configuration. Now, what happens if we incorporate a dopant, an impurity, atom into the crystal structure. We'll pick a donor. This is a group 5 material. Group 5 means it has five electrons in its outer shell. When it's incorporated into the crystal structure, four of those electrons are being used in the bonds with the neighboring silicon. But that leaves one electron left over. This leftover electron is unbonded. As such, it is very easy to remove it from the arsenic. Arsenic in the example uh, shown here could be some of the other group 5 materials They would work the same way. If I give it just a little bit of energy, the kind of energy you get just from being at room temperature, thermal energy, that electron is very, very easily removed. It becomes a mobile electron, not bound into the crystal structure, leaving behind an ionized arsenic, an ionized uh, impurity. In this case, it would be positively charged. Now, there's charge balance. I have one positive and one negative charge here, but the positive charge is fixed. The ionized dopant is fixed in the crystal structure. That charge is not going anywhere. But the electron that came off is mobile, so it changes in the concentration of the mobile electrons in the semiconductor. And that's what we're doing. We're adding dopants to increase, in this case, increase n the concentration of the mobile charge carriers. We call these kinds of group 5 dopants or impurities donors because they donate an electron. Acceptors, on the other hand, accept electrons. Here we show boron. It's incorporated into the crystal structure here. And because it only has three uh, outer shell electrons, it's missing one. So it doesn't have a complete bond here shown next to its silicon, is missing an electron. It wants an electron there so that it can complete its, its shell. 
where can it possibly get one? Well, there's bonds all over the place. And it's very easy, very low energy operation for an electron of a nearby bond to move to that missing bond, therefore ionizing the dopant. Now, what's left? My boron has a negative charge because it has this extra electron around it now. It's ionized. I have a complete bond here. And what, are, what did I leave behind? I left behind a hole. The hole is the missing electron, uh, the place in the bond where you would want it. That hole is shared by the two silicon atoms. Uh, this hole is mobile. It can move around. You apply an electric field, it will move. Um, what we've done is ionized our dopant. It has accepted an electron to fill its outer shell and created a mobile hole, a positive charge that can move around. This is what happens when you use a group three impurity and incorporate it into the crystal structure. Now, we can do some math and calculate how a certain amount of dopant will result in a certain amount of mobile charge carriers. Two equations we'll use will be charge balance and the mass action equation. So let me define some terms. We'll let N sub A be the acceptor concentration, N sub D the donor concentration. These are the concentrations of the dopants that we add. Then N sub A minus will be the ionized acceptor concentration, and N sub D plus will be the ionized donor concentration. Now the assumption we'll make, which is a very good one, is that at room temperature there's sufficient amount of energy present to ionize all the dopants. This is a good approximation until the dopant concentrations get very, very high, usually much higher than we'll be interested in using in semiconductor manufacturing, but uh, it, there can be some deviations. For almost all cases, though, we can make the assumption that every acceptor or donor atom that is incorporated into the crystal structure will ionize at room temperature. Therefore, the concentra these concentrations are equated. Now we know what these are because these are, are the amount of dopants we add, so we control what that is. Now, the, the next uh, thing we know is that there must be charge balance. The total amount of positive charges in the semiconductor must equal the total amount of negative charges. Well, where do the positive charges come from? Well, there's the ionized donors and the holes. So ND plus plus P, the hole concentration, is the total amount of positive charge, and that must equal the total amount of negative charge, which is Na minus the ionized acceptors plus the free electrons. One more relationship. When these charge carriers are at equilibrium, we'll be having generation recombination uh, such that the product of n times p is a constant. This comes from writing out the equilibrium uh, recombination and generation equation. And since n times p is a constant, and we know what n times p is for intrinsic material, it's simply ni squared, we know what the constant is. It is ni squared. So the mass action equation says n times p is ni squared. What that means is this. If I were to increase the number of mobile electrons, make n larger, by necessity p must be made smaller so that n times p is a constant. Well, if I have lots of extra electrons floating around, then it's much more likely a hole is going to run into an electron and get annihilated in a recombination reaction. Therefore, the, the number of holes starts to decrease. And uh, n times p stays constant, but with n large, p will become small. Now, let's take an example. Suppose I have a wafer that's doped p-type. Remember, we said when we were talking about making wafers that we almost always dope our wafers with a small amount of dopant. We can have p-type wafers and n-type wafers. They're typically doped in the uh, 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 16 per cubic centimeter range of, of concentration. This becomes a background dopant level for our wafers. Now, I have this p-type wafer. Let's say Na is 2 times 10 to the 16th uh, per cubic centimeter. So it's kind of a heavily doped, you know, a reasonably doped wafer. Now, let's add in some region an n-type dopant with N, day, n sub d, the, the donor concentration, equal to 1 times 10 to the 18th per cubic centimeter. 
Now, under these conditions, what are M and P? That will be temperature dependent, but we'll be working all of our problems at room temperature because uh, we, can, we can figure out what the, um, uh, the intrinsic concentration of, of charge carriers is at other temperatures as well, but uh, most, mostly we'll, we'll do our problems at room temperature because that's basically the temperature we're operating our semiconductor, semiconductor devices at. We'll assume complete ionization so that every dopant that we introduce becomes ionized. Therefore, we have two equations and two unknowns. Uh, we know what this is and we know what this is. What we don't know is N and P. So solve these two equations simultaneously and we have it. Not hard to do, but in fact it uh, can be simplified even further. Since we have an excess of donors, being added compared to the acceptors. There's going to be lots of mobile electrons because all those donors are going to generate mobile electrons. The majority carrier, we call it. Uh, the, and if there's a bunch of electrons, mobile electrons, there will be fewer holes because n times p has to be a constant. The minority carrier will be the concentration of holes and that will be small. So what we're going to do is take our charge balance equation and ignore p. We'll assume it's much, much smaller than n We'll check the assumption at the end. Um, and then calculate N as simply the difference in the doping levels. So I started out with a certain amount of acceptor in the, in the uh, bare blank wafer. I added donors in my uh, doping operation. The difference between those two will be the concentration of the mobile electrons. Then we can calculate the, uh, the, the whole concentration. Uh, by simply using the, the, the mass action uh, equation. And we see that P is about 2 times 10 to the second. That is a couple of hundred holes per cubic centimeter versus uh, about 1 times 10 to the 18th electrons per cubic centimeter. So the assumption that P is very small is a, a very, very good one. Uh, whenever you dope above the intrinsic concentration, you're going to be dominated by one or the other in most circumstances uh, of your dopants. So this actually makes the, the math of calculating what N and P are even simpler. Well, let's use this knowledge to build our first electrical device. I'm going to build a very, very simple electrical device, a resistor. Let's go back to pre-semiconductor understanding and talk about how to build a resistor made out of just a single normal material, a metal or an insulator, for example. If we have a bar of material, some length L, uh, cross-section area A, which is equal to the width times the thickness T, uh, and I look at the resistance of that bar from one end to the other uh, along that length L. The resistance of the bar will be the resistivity of the material times the length divided by the cross-sectional area. The resistivity is 1 over the conductivity, and these are simply material properties. We can look up in a table what the resistivity or the conductivity of copper is, or silicon dioxide, or uh, any of a number of materials that we might use to make our resistor. Well, with a semiconductor, things are a little bit different because the conductivity of a semiconductor can be varied by doping. That's one of the properties, one of the important things about a semiconductor is that we can change its conductivity, its electrical properties in a number of ways, but doping being one of the ways that we can do it locally. Here is the expression for the conductivity of a semiconductor material as a function of the number of mobile charge and hole carriers. The conductivity, sigma, is equal to the charge on an electron, Q, multiplied by uh, the charge carrier concentration times the mobility of that charge carrier for each of the two charge carriers. So Q is simply a constant, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th. Uh, N is the uh, mobile electron concentration, depending on how much doping you, you've added. Uh, mu sub n is called the electron mobility, and it's a function of temperature, but at room temperature it has a certain value for a certain material. Uh, for silicon, uh, 
the mobility is 1500 centimeters squared per volt seconds. Looks a little bit like an odd unit, but it'll work out when we, when we actually plug things in. Uh, the mobility of the hole is mu sub p. It's 450 centimeters squared per volt seconds. Notice that there's about a factor of three difference. Electrons move more readily through the crystal structure than holes do. You can probably guess why that is true. Um, but for any given value of n and p, we can plug it into this equation and calculate what the conductivity of the silicon material is. All right, so let's do that. We had a wafer that was dope p-type with Na equal 2 times uh, 10 to the 16th per square cubic centimeter. Now we're going to add this n-type dopant in some region that will make up our transistor. That is over a length L and width W and thickness T. Let's calculate what the conductivity of the wafer is before we've doped it. In this case, uh, we have mostly holes because we've doped it with acceptors and there's very very few electrons so we could ignore this term and we see that the uh, amount of holes that we have is simply the amount of dopant atoms in our wafer. So the conductivity is Q times Na times mu sub P which in this case turns out to be about 1.4 per ohm centimeters. Uh, that's fairly low conductivity. Uh, the wafer is acting pretty much like an insulator. Now let's look at some units. Remember mobility was centimeter squared per volt seconds. Well an ampere is one coulomb per second and an ohm is one volt per amp. And that's how when we plug in all of our numbers we end up with units of ohm centimeters. In the material where we add our extra n-type dopant, that is the region where we're going to make our resistor, the number of free electrons will dominate, as we saw, the number of free holes. So this term is insignificant, p times mu sub p, and the only thing we have left is n times mu sub n, and n is about equal to the concentration of, of the donors, or to be more exact, nd minus na. So we plug in the values here and we get about 240 per ohm centimeters for the conductivity of the region that we're doping, uh, which we're going to make our resistor out of. So you see that the conductivity is higher by about a factor of 200 in this region. Now we'll let our doping occur in this confined region that has a length w, a width, uh, let's, let's make the length, um, excuse me, a length of 2 microns. We'll make W, the width of this region, a quarter of a micron, and we'll make the thickness uh, in which we put the dopant material about 0.12 microns. We have our formula for the resistivity of uh, bar, uh, rho times L divided by the cross-sectional area. We know rho is 1 over 240 with units of ohm centimeters. We know uh, L is 2 microns, A is uh, 0.25 times 0.12 microns. We have to convert from microns to centimeters. There's 10,000 microns in a centimeter, 1,000 microns in a millimeter, 10 millimeters in a centimeter. Uh, and we plug all that in, we get a distance of kilo ohms. So that becomes our first electrical device. We've just built a resistor. You can see that if we needed different resistors, different values for the resistance, what could we do? Well, we can change the physical dimensions. L, W, T, uh, or we can change the resistivity rho by changing the doping concentration. So we have a lot of knobs available to us to dial in the resistance that we want for a particular electrical circuit. So what have we learned in our discussion of doping so far? Well, uh, we all should be able to define an extrinsic silicon and compare and contrast that with intrinsic silicon. What are donors and acceptors? Why are they different? Why do we use the names donors and acceptors? Why must the impurities be incorporated into the crystal lattice before they can act as dopants? Use the charge balance and mass action equations to determine N and P for different doping levels, different circumstances. And you should know how to calculate the conductivity of a semiconductor 
and the resistance of a bar that was made from the semiconductor material. Well, that's our lecture this time. See you next time.